Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are joining us from today. My name is Chris Martin, and I am the Associate Director of the Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies at Harvard University. And on behalf of my colleagues and co-organizers, I'd like to welcome you to our third of seven panels on in the Queer Focus series. The series has generous sponsorship from the Association for Slavic, East European, and Eurasian Studies, as well as from peer regional centers throughout the U.S. The series is now in its fourth year, having previously centered on themes such as race, intersectionality, and decolonization. So, as the title uh, forecasts, this year's series focuses on queer communities throughout Eastern Europe and Eurasia, and I invite you, our audience, to join all the panels taking place in this semester. I'll put a link in the chat that will direct you to um, the opportunity to register for our future sessions. And you can watch any session that you've missed on the Davis Center YouTube page. So this year's series was developed and executed by the Davis Center alongside Emma Pratt and Alicia Baca at Ohio State Center for Slavic and East European Studies and Jujana Magdo at the University of Pittsburgh Center for Russian, East European and Eurasian Studies. We also have sponsorship from other peer regional studies centers, including the University of Kansas, the University of Michigan, UNC Chapel Hill, Indiana University of Bloomington, the George Washington University, the University of California, Berkeley, and Arizona State University. So our thanks to all of our partners. And last but not least, we extend our gratitude to the speakers for today's session, for answering our call and stepping into this conversation, which is so critical for our field. Today's topic is queer focus on arts and culture. And before I hand it over to our moderator, a bit of housekeeping, please use Zoom's Q&A function to post questions for our speakers. And any questions that come in through YouTube will also be shared with our moderator. So it's my pleasure now to turn it over to our moderator, who is Dr. Philip Gleisner. Uh, Philip is an assistant professor in Slavic and East European languages and cultures at Ohio State. He specializes in the cultures and literatures of socialist Eastern and Central Europe, with an emphasis on print media in the USSR and Czechoslovakia. Dr. Gleisner's monograph on this topic, titled Subscribing to Sovietdom, The Lives of the Socialist Literary Journal, is forthcoming from the University of Toronto Press. The book pursues a holistic analysis of the synthetic media archetype as a core element of the socialist literary system, as visual objects of everyday culture and social events. Together with Harry Cashton, Gleisner also edited the volume Resilient Kitchens, American Immigrant Cooking in a Time of Crisis, Essays and Recipes. He is also the editor, along with Bradley Gorski, of Red Migrations, Transnational Mobility and Leftist Culture After 1917, which is forthcoming from the University of Toronto Press. At Ohio State, Gleister teaches courses on Soviet and Central European culture, migration, and queer studies. His current project, Kvier is Dot, is an attempt to rethink digital humanities from a queer perspective, specifically with a focus on queer Russian periodicals of the last 30 years. So we are in good hands today with moderation for this panel. And Philip, I'll turn it over to you with our thanks. Well, thank you so much for the kind introduction and good morning, everyone. I'm so pleased that we were given this opportunity for this panel and would like to start by thanking as well, thanking the Davis Center at Harvard for their logistical support and all the area study centers involved in supporting this thematic focus that in light of the rampant homo and transphobic political discourse and violence in parts of our region and elsewhere is particularly urgent. Finally, I'd like to express my gratitude to the Center for Slavic, East European and Eurasian Studies at my own institution, Ohio State, and especially Emma Pratt and Alicia Baca for their contributions to conceptualizing this series in general and our panel in particular. The ways in which we understand and conceptualize gender and sexuality are always culturally and historically determined and framed. For more than three decades now, scholars have investigated East European representations of gender and sexuality with this realization in mind, with varying results that at times highlighted differences from Western paradigms, at times even in a key that has been criticized as orientalizing. Others have viewed Eastern Europe through a lens that expressed a desire for conceptual alignment with the West, the European Union, the United States, a position that has also been critiqued as intellectually imperialist or even homonormative. This poses a central conundrum to the field of East European queer studies. How do we get it right when so many answers seem wrong? 
All of today's speakers have an impressive record of research in queer studies that contributes to complexly answering this question. And of course, many more. They all focus on literature and art, and I'm so glad that they will share with us today some of their material, which will doubtlessly be new and exciting to many of us. Engaging closely with a variety of genres from diverse corners of our region, as well as in transnational contexts, today's speakers have answered to some of our central questions, have answers to some of our central questions. How are gender and sexual identity, and especially queerness, understood and negotiated in Eastern Europe? How does art, broadly conceived, how does art express or address the political dimensions of gender and sexuality and serve as a tool for community building? And what scholarly methods allow us to analyze cultural production through a queer lens? Our presenters today have agreed to prepare presentations of examples from their concrete research that can contribute to answering these questions and we'll proceed the following way. I will introduce each of our speakers one by one before they speak. They will share with us their presentations for about 10 minutes each and then we'll hopefully have plenty of time for discussion and questions. Again, use the Q&A box, uh, post your questions as we go and we can address them later. So, our first speaker today is Ramona Dima a researcher in queer Romanian and Southeastern Europe issues. With a PhD from the University of Bucharest, Dr. Dima's publications and topics of interest include queer culture, sexuality and migration, LGBT plus activism and anti-gender movements. Since 2014, she has been collaborating with her life and work partner, developing a video and performance-based art practice. She is the initiator and co-organizer of Queer Femme SE, the only queer and feminist international conference with a focus on Southeastern Europe. Between 21 and 23, she led the Marie Skłodowska Curie postdoctoral project, Queer Her Stories of Struggle and Survival in Romania from Communist Criminalization to Contemporary, uh, to contemporary Anti Gender Movements in SE Spaces, hosted by the Center for Gender Studies at the University of Stavanger. And her book, Queer Culture in Romania, 1920 to 2018, appeared last year with Paul Griff Macmillan. So, Ramona, you have the word. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. And uh, hello, everyone. Uh, today, I will speak about uh, queer culture shifts in Romania. So, is there anything special with the queer Romanian culture and context? And how is culture negotiated nowadays? And which are the main steps? in this process? These are a few questions I will try to answer today. To better understand how queer representations function in Romanian contemporary culture, it is necessary to anchor the cultural materials in the socio-political nuances that accompanied them. The emergence of a queer culture in Romania is closely connected to the repeal of Article 200, which criminalized homosexuality. And it was only in 2001 that same-sex relationships were decriminalized in Romania. This was the result of important struggles and lobbying by various Romanian and foreign individuals, groups, and associations, which opened up the activist work uh, on LGBT issues. And this is not to say that there were new, no queer cultural products before this moment. In fact, in my book that Philip mentioned, Queer Culture in Romania from 1920s to 2018, I choose to analyze a wide range of such sources, and uh, which are mainly consisting of uh, literature containing LGBT characters or topics, which were produced from the beginning of 1900s. And it was particularly interesting to develop on how these products find their way to the public even during communist regime. And a special note is needed here, uh, while other socialist Eastern European countries, such as Hungary, such as Poland, former Yugoslavia and Russia, have had incipient forms of queer activism since the late 80s, which then continued to be developed during the 90s with prevailing archival material. The same cannot be said about Romania. And compared to other countries under the Soviet influence, Communist Romania was isolated, especially regarding access to information and other intellectual and cultural resources. Moreover, some countries such as Hungary, Bulgaria and Czechoslovakia decriminalized homosexuality during the 60s and 70s. Communist Romania saw an opposing tendency 
with more restrictive legislation, which also targeted women and their reproductive rights. But what about the composition of these movements? For example, Schenk shows how the lesbian movement was part of the social movements within East Germany, with different such groups coagulating before 1989. And this is particularly interesting since the Romanian queer activist scene has been and continues to be, I might argue, dominated by cis homosexual men. As the Romanian LGBT NGO scene emerged during the 90s, its focus was to work on legal cases against the state and uh, against acts of discrimination. And it did so while portraying the figures of gay respectability by retracing a fragmented history of male-dominated Romanian queerness and by showing less interest in representational issues in form of critiques, debates, and struggles taking place within the newly formed community. So in other words, uh, other LGBT identities than gay men were less or not at all represented. And the idea of auto-representation was formed at later stages. And it was mainly due to the work of Romani feminists and trans people in Romania. So in my work, I use a context-driven methodology. <clears throat> I look at Romanian queer culture from inside as a queer person myself who has been uh, living in Romania for my first 28 years and had contact with different groups and scenes within the feminist and queer spheres. And this methodology is also stemming from the acknowledgement that the research process is guided by the sensitivity of the approach topics, is guided by the lack of archival footprints and by a solid dose of media archeology, span especially when looking at the beginning of Romanian LGBT activism. I start with contemporary Romanian cultural products that are either focusing on queer topics or are produced by queer creators. Then I look back using different lenses into the memories of similar queer and trans activists sharing their experiences in the extensive interviews I have conducted, as well as into fragmented literary and media sources which cover most part of the 20th century. And this is a heavy responsibility of acting as an archivist and a mediator between the world uh, and the often small, independent, and nearly forgotten cultural acts or objects. While there is a select, albeit not extensive, body of research and publications when it comes to queer affects and culture in Central Europe and the Balkans, particularly focused on the second half of the 20th century, none has been looking in depth into Romania. And one reason might be the difficulties in accessing and understanding this place in relation to the study of queer and gender and culture uh, in the absence of well-structured organizations with an archival impulse. And the lack of history, or maybe poorly acknowledging the history, the lack of references and reflection over overseas concepts related to queerness and adopted by the Romanian activist scene, all have been mirrored in many Romanian queer products. And I argue that it is uh, an extremely relevant and specific type of queer culture that has been the result of it. Apart from the cultural examples in themselves, I was also interested in the nuances and differences in queer culture producers' experiences and backgrounds, as well as in highlighting certain critiques of the way mainstream queer products were dealing with, for example, disproportionate representations of certain LGBT experiences over more marginal ones. The literature on the topic usually investigates the heteronormative power and normativity, which are exercised from the outside over certain queer communities. And what I did was to also investigate how the same processes can work in constructing the most prominent voices within a said queer community, which often neglect other categories. And this is reflected in the discourse and cultural products they choose to promote or to create. Ident uh, I identify several stages in the construction of a queer Romanian culture, which still remains a niche and is influenced by several factors, such as who chooses to represent queer issues in cultural terms, what motives stand behind these representations, and these motives could be pure activist reasons or artistic reasons, etc and how critiques of representation stemming from parts of the community are dealt with or incorporated in these products. 
And these stages are probably intersecting others in the Southeastern European spaces. When uh, taking the example of visual arts, film, performances, and theater, the initial stages had queer artists at their forefront. They showed less concern for the idea of respectability. The visual products were a first for the Romanian cultural scene and were easily perceived as shocking in the absence of a more established tradition and discussions on the disruptive nature of some queer cultural products can have. And I refer, for instance, to some niche art exhibition in the late 90s and early 2000s by Vasile Murivale and Razvan Ion. Following this stage from mid 2000s, more cultural pieces started to be developed where queer artists positioned themselves as part of a niche and assumed the work of opening the cultural field to alternative topics and issues concerning sexualities. But in parallel, a small scale mainstreamization of queer culture began. Once authors, most of them outside of the queer community, fructified the novelty of such topics and started to create cultural products about LGBT people and issues. And we have, for example, maybe uh, more, more familiar films such as Christian Mungiu's film, Beyond the Hills from 2012, or Tudor Giorgio's Lovesick from 2006. The problem with this process was that many creators did not have contact with the community or chose to represent queer people using stereotypical images. Another more recent critique revolves around the concept of respectability and how different identity layers are erased when constructing queer characters. And I will conclude by offering a very recent example on how respectability and representability are currently debated within the mainstream and queer artistical scenes in Romania. So last week, the premiere of a Romanian translation of the play I Am My Own Wife by Doug Wright, uh, which depicts the life of a transgender woman, Charlotte von Marsdorp, uh, was produced by a theater in Bucharest. And it was interrupted by uh, Roma and trans women activist Antonella Lerca Duda. Uh, uh, talking to the public, her main critiques were that neither the presentation text of the play nor the director explicitly stated that the play revolves around a trans person. Uh, the choice of casting a heterosexual cis man in the role was also addressed, along with the critique directed towards the production team, which has not consulted members of the community, queer community, while working on this show. And this process, uh, protest is very interesting for me because it had echoes in both mainstream media and in the inner queer cultural circles, uh, with sites rapidly forming for or against the activists' right to interrupt an artistic product and the validity of the expressed points. And this is a clear example of a manifest against the idea of respectability. And it raises questions such as what it means to speak about queerness without being informed by it, uh, while uh, brainstorming older LGBT activist debates. And the choice of different queer NGOs and voices to either solidarize or desolidarize with the activist was also visible in the social media reactions and debates. So what does this example has to say about queer dilemmas in relation to art, about matters of representation and about how community building works when it comes to queer individuals? So I will stop here and maybe we can develop more on this during our discussion. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ramona. And we will move on to our second speaker for the day. But before that, I'll remind you, if you have questions, you can share them already and go ahead and do that if you have questions for Ramona specifically. So they're written down. And I'll introduce our second speaker. Luc Baudouin, who is a professor in the Gender and Women's Studies program at the University of Denver. He completed his PhD in Russian literature at the University of Toronto in 93 and subsequently joined University of Denver, teaching both in the Russian language and literature program as well as queer studies in gender and women's studies. He moved to gender and women's studies permanently in 2020, and his most recent book, Lost and Found Voices, Four Gay Male Writers in Exile, published by McGill Queens. University Press in late 22, examines the queer voices of Vitor Gombrovic, Valery Pereleshin, Abdella Taia, and Slava Magutin. His current book project uncovers the role of Rio de Janeiro in 
the queer, in creating the queer identities of Valérie Perilation, Antonio Botto, Conrad Letres, and Hubert Fichte. So, Luke, you have the word. Thank you, and thank you, Philip. Hello. Uh, let me start the, the slides, which I hope you can see. Can you see the slides? Not yet. Something is wrong. Uh, technological issues, as always. All right. We try it again. <laughs> Share. And now I should be able to do it correctly. How about now? Well, we should be right now, correct? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's funny how we get out of habit with Zoom when the pandemic ended. Um, thank you again. Thank you, Philip. In my recent work, I have wanted to locate queerness where it is both shouted and whispered, where it is insinuated and erased, leading me ultimately to the borders of sexual citizenship and public and artistic spheres. Uh, some shameless self-promotion here. My recent book, Lost and Found Voices, Four Gay Male in, in Exile, looks at different negotiated queer linguistic identities through the works of Vital Gombrovich, Abdel Ataya, Valeri Perilyeshin, and Slava Magud. I trace the dialogue that their works, and by implication their queer identities, have had with their readers, and how that dialogue is shaped by culture and language, by the interaction their queerness has with the non-queerness that surrounds them, by their ambivalence about received, often Western, manifestations of homosexuality and gender identities. Today, I want to briefly discuss Perilyeshin and Magutin, two Russophone poets in exile, by circumstance and by choice, both gay, both of whom create a queer sense of identity grounded in their Russian pasts and in their engagement with the gayness of their adopted homes. Valeri Perilyeshin lived most, most of his life in Rio de Janeiro and was one of the few publicly gay Russophone writers of his generation. Before his death in 1992, he had written 14 books of poetry and five books of translations, mostly self-published in Russian and Portuguese, with another, his autobiographical book, Poem Without a Subject, published in whole in 1987 through the charity of the late Simon Karlinsky. In 1976, he effectively came out as gay in Ariel, his ninth collection of poetry. When he effectively came out as gay in Ariel, his ninth collection of poetry, the Russian diaspora, whom the book scandalized by what they pronounced was a sodomitic filth, by its overt claim that Russian culture was at least partially based on the desires of homosexuals, by its shameless celebration of a public gay heritage, by its insistence that homosexuality is something indeed important to consider in an author's or artist's life and not something to sweep under the rug, it was too much. They destroyed or gave away his publications. Still continuing to write in Russian, Perilyeshin also then turned to Portuguese, even though he was an unknown in Brazilian letters. But the choice emancipated his queer desires, liberated them from his Russophone readers, and most importantly, gave him license to write in the language in which he had sex. It was freedom. Rio was unlike any other city Perilyeshin had experienced, one where he could find men comparatively easily, as the stigma of homosexual, only applied if those men were passive partners in their sexual encounters with other men. Perilyeshin located and identified his homosexuality, or as he preferred to say, his left-handedness, in the streets of Copacabana, where homosexual life was divided into zones, where straight men would know where they could find sex with a man if they so desired, where drag queens could parade. Those zones were oriented around the Copacabana Palace, in front of which, on the beach, flies a rainbow flag even today and during the annual carnival, when Catholic-inspired morality went on vacation. But Pierre Dnieshin was not a part of the Brazilian gay community, preferring the uncertainty of the men he pursued in his quiet, if impoverished, life with his aristocratic mother. His later poetry, initially mostly in Portuguese, but also in Russian, reflected a queer identity that grew clearer in response to his sexual encounters, experienced as they were through daily interactions in a language that became pregnant with the intimations of desire between him and the men he picked up or wanted to pick up. Everyone could be available unless proven otherwise. He no longer cared what the diaspora might think, even as he continued to commit to a spiritual gay male heritage from the classical world and the Russian Silver Age. In his last published Russian language collection, In Pursuit, 
He includes a poem that describes his encounters with a young salesman, a diversion from the emptiness he felt after one of his only true loves, Humberto Passus, had left him. It is a distillation of his identity, always an outsider, but an outsider who can get pleasure whenever he wants, if even only in his poems. And I'll read it quickly. All these translations are mine, by the way. Should I try? Almost not yours. In the candy store, I'm a prisoner of gray eyes. He's the best salesman, the only one in a thousand hearts. There are such fairy tales in life. He doesn't drop his mask for a moment. The bill is written, a smile, and the end. He might come to my paper palace, but the fear of publicity stands in the way. To distract my melancholy away from you, I want his unmanly shoulders, cold lips with an unquestioning purse. Laugh too from afar. Can these childish springs of 16 compete with your 40s? My second writer, Slava Magutin, has crafted his queer identity like Tiridieschen in a masculinist gay fashion. But in Magutin's case, with the intent of undermining a neoliberal consensus of what gay and queer might mean. Born in Siberia in 1974, Magutin loca relocated to Moscow. And after attempting to marry his, then Amer his American then boyfriend in the early 1990s, he claimed asylum in the United States. The move forced Magutin to resituate himself in a different queer queer vocabulary, both culturally and linguistically, literally with English, figuratively with respect to a United States that by then was beginning to fight for the mainstream recognition that marriage equality would bring. What was a rebellious act of stage defiance in Moscow was viewed instead as an emblem of assimilation in New York, the ultimate goal of a corporatized gay and lesbian America. Magutin, however, was already well-versed with the queer rebels of the West, the Mapplethorpes and the Ginsburgs and the Warhols. And it is with this tradition that he creates his queer identity, a response to the sanitized homosexuality that the West prefers. An answer that sits between cultures and languages, atop the fetishizing of the former USSR, astride a culture that saw itself as both victor and vanquished, queerly so. His early work, such as the two short works on this slide from his 1999 book, American My Pants, barely touches on his concerns to come, but we can see the beginnings of a queer sense of self existing in between, a faint sexualization of a state of being, an almost abject rebirth to come. He is rejecting what he sees as a chauvinistic Russia, but is also ambivalent about his new home. The first one, Mother Tongue. When I encounter Russians on the streets of New York, and this happens quite often, I feel uncomfortable with their conversations. What they say, what they talk about, and how they talk. Oh, the great and mighty. Of course, the conversations of Americans on the streets of New York aren't much more meaningful, but that's their problem. At least I'm not ashamed of them, and I don't feel bad for their country. And the second, my universities. I never really studied English. Every time people ask me where I learned the language, I honestly answer, in bed. Polyglottism is an occupational disease of hard currency prostitutes. Yet very quickly, recognizing what he sees as the emptiness of corporate queer identities, Magutin wrote works and created art that exist at the limits of gay sensibility. He calls us to face the fact that gayness is centered on sex, to reject a false homonormativity. He makes eroticism public, forcing us to analyze both our own squeamishness and our complicity in the traffic of sexualized others of men oftentimes divorced from their identities, their pasts, and their futures. He rejoices in his body, its power, and its ability to give him pleasure. He links his body explicitly to the act of writing and creation, agitating against the notion that queer can or should ever be considered normal by a society that has sold its soul for profit. He often seems to prefer Berlin to New York or Los Angeles, perhaps because Berlin hosts the sex rebels more easily. Those rebels are transnational emblems of borderline masculinities that he dubbed the true heroes of our time, the, and I quote, young rebels and social outcasts, modern day beautiful losers, teenagers and young men from different urban male subcultures, Russian ravers, street hustlers, military cadets, Crimean Rasta boys, German skinheads, and football hooligans, Dutch skaters, Toronto punks, end quote all queered by their shared maleness. Magutin has been selective about which works he has published in English in his only collection to date, Food Chain, and has instead mostly moved to art and photography. The photograph to the right of the Food Chain cover, while not taken by Magutin, 
is from his Tumblr account, which is not recently very active, and is emblematic of the message he is giving us. It is an on-site reinterpretation of Ukrainian-born Alyek Kulik's art installation, I Bite America and America Bites Me. Magudin has entered Kulik's cage with a protective glove, just in case the dog bites. Kulik's work questions the myriad possibilities of what a human dog in a cage interacting with humans might mean. Here the queer, Magudin, is dominating the dog that represents America, old, naked, goofily smiling here, but potentially fierce. The gay rebel wins for now, but the dog can still bite and kill. There is a reason to wear that glove, after all. Or control. In a recent poem, sanitized just a little for in translation for this talk, Magudin emphasizes how queerness, or the reaction to it, is carefully calibrated by algorithms and the media, by religious prejudice piped in on television. How can there be a queer, how can there be queer, when we await instructions on how to live? And I'll read this as well. The demon of love climbed into me. Let's assume we'll let them down. Let's assume we'll set them free. Let's assume we'll punish them. Let's assume we'll hang them. Childhood fear, an ax in the gut. Let's look in the monitor. Let's tell it like it is. Let's gobble it up. We need to eat. The demon of love possessed me. Let me know who to pray to, how, what to do, how to live, who to have sex with, who to strangle. Both Valeri Peninyeshin and Slava Magutin locate their homosexuality, their queerness, in the spaces between the Russian heritage and the societies they find themselves in. They don't exist fully within those societies, not as they would have expected to in any case, yet they create new possibilities of what queer might be, challenging our received ideas of what it should be. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I will go ahead and introduce our next speaker, who is Maria Engström, who is a professor of Russian and director of the master's program in the Russian language in international relations at Uppsala University, Sweden. Her research focuses on Russian intellectual history, late Soviet underground culture, Russian queer visual culture, and contemporary Russian conservatism. She co-edited co the Oxford Handbook of Soviet Underground Culture and Digital N24, and the book Digital Orthodoxy, Mediating Post-Secularity in Russia in 2015. Engstrom's publications include Queering Socialist Realism, The Case of Georgi Guryanov in 23, Transgressing Mainstream, Camp, Queer, and Populism in Russian Visual Culture, 21, Reimagining Antiquity, The Conservative Discourse of Russia as the True Europe and the Kremlin's New Cultural Policy in 20, Apollo Against Black Square, Conservative Futurism in Contemporary Russia, and her current project, Nostalgia of Modernity, Neo-Soviet Myth in Contemporary Russian Culture is supported by the Swedish Research Council. So, Maria, please. Thank you so much, Philip. Um, thank you for the invitation. I am really happy to be part of this uh, panel. And uh, as maybe you understand, my research about queer culture uh, is connected to my research uh, on uh, Russian conservatism. So today I will uh, present um, sorry. Yes, uh, so today I will uh, focus on the reinterpretation of socialist realism and Soviet legacy uh, in the works of two uh, most famous and expensive contemporary queer Russian artists, Timur Novikov and uh, Georgi Guryanov. Uh, so Guryanov uh, was a key figure in uh, the 1980s Leningrad on the ground and the drama for <clears throat> Russia's most famous and mega popular rock band Kino. Uh, through the mid 80s, Guryanov painted in kind of neo expressionist uh, style and, and was a part of Novoy um, Hudorzhniki, uh, the new artist, a group of young rebels. Or, non-conformist artists and musicians headed up by Timur Novikov, uh, also very 
uh, famous artist uh, and uh, theoretician uh, from Leningrad. In 1989, uh, under Novikov's uh, direction, these artists uh, found a way to be even more radical, uh, reverting to um, neoclassicism <clears throat> and what one could call neo-socialist realism. The new Academy of Fine Arts, Nova Academia Iziashnik Iskust, was born. And uh, Petersburg became a center of uh, queer culture and became, I think, the center of queer culture through the old 90s and uh, early 2000s, uh, until the death of Novikov in 2002. Uh, so the new academy was uh, joined by uh, artists uh, such as, as Vladislav Mamashev Monroe, Oleg Maslov and Viktor Kuznetsov, uh, Bela Matveyeva, Denis Yegelsky, Olga Tabrelutz, uh, Igor Astrov, Sergei, Sergei Kuryohin, who was a musician uh, from Leningrad, and uh, many, many others. So the main purpose of the new academy was to reintroduce figuration in contemporary art and to advance classical beauty as a radical aesthetic and ideological alternative to Moscow conceptualism. Uh, Neo-academicians remediated and fused iconic images from antiquity or Soviet culture by presenting them in a new context or in new media. For example, uh, screen printing or computer graphics uh, and, and, uh, and so forth. Uh, Timur Novikov came out with this uh, neo-academic project after a trip he and Gurianov took to France and the United States in uh, 1989 and 1990, during which he became acquainted galleries. For them, transnational queer <clears throat> figurative art and neoclassical aesthetics uh, was the universal language that was supposed to give Russians, uh, this post-Soviet Russian artists, access uh, to the international art market. Neoclassicism opposed the national approach to art and was initially uh, conceived as a global and transcultural project rather than a local Russian one. Um, as the main model for his neo-academic project, Novikov chose the work of uh, Robert uh, uh, Mapplethorpe and uh, his concept of being, uh, binding antiquity with modernity. Um, for example, uh, as you can see here, counterculture with uh, punk and gay underground with uh, neoclassical visuality. Um, so Mapplethorpe talked of photography as a new type of sculpture um, and influenced the neo-academicians as a master of so-called sculptural photography or the photographing of the living as the dead and the dead as the living. So following uh, uh, Mapplethorpe, uh, Novikov proclaimed a new cult of Apollo and created visual manifestos of neo-academism. Um, Apollo trampling on the black square and Apollo trampling on the red square. Um, so what is interesting that Novikov develops uh, the theory of Apollonism for the masses using glossy magazines and fashion photographies as a main medium for his ideas and making by this way a queer visuality mainstream uh, during the 90s. And in his article, uh, Tiny Cult, The Secret Cult, which was written in 1992 uh, to mark the opening of the exhibition with the same name, Novikov explicitly links the cult of Apollo with queer art uh, and sees the departure of beauty from 20th century art as a result of a culture war between modernists, which he calls the enemy, enemies of beauty, and gay artists and musicians. So he writes, uh, modernists of all sorts 
captured our cities and in the academies, the statues have been smashed uh, to smithereens. The square reigns supreme, the black square, the symbol of Apollo, uh, bad dream. Uh, so Novikov defines uh, photographing art objects, architecture, and remakes of other photographs as a part of the neo academy theory of recomposition and aesthetic ecology. A distinct uh, feature of neo academism as a queer art is the interest in Soviet visuality, uh, mostly of the 30s and 50s. For example, Deinerka, Samachvalov. And actually, it was Novikov who made this uh, socialist realist artist popular, uh, not only for uh, its kind of neoclassical aesthetic, but also as a source of uh, homoerotic themes. Uh, while the vast majority of works of post Soviet art uh, deal with Soviet trauma, uh, queer artists of the New Academy turn uh, turn their attention to Soviet beauty. Um, Guryanov uh, early work involved uh, coloring, a kind of retouching Soviet posters and photographs. And his later paintings were also based on photographic slide projection. One of the first artistically, artistically convincing um, experiments to inscribe the legacy of socialist realism in the context of queer visuality was an exhibition uh, um, of Guryanov's works entitled uh, Sila Volia, uh, Willpower, uh, held in uh, 92 in St. Petersburg and Moscow and curated by Novikov. So in this exhibition, uh, you can see part of it, um, Guryanov famous um, triptych, Strogi Yunosha, uh, Estonian young man, was displayed. And, and this work uh, is a queer remix uh, of stills from uh, 1936 Abram Rome film with the same name. So as originals uh, for his paintings, Guryanov takes models both uh, from Soviet and Western art, uh, mostly from the 30s, a gesture intended to emphasize the universality uh, of the cult of masculinity in the e era of uh, interwar modernism. So it could be uh, Rochinka uh, that he remakes or Ivan Shagin photographs. And uh, here you can see Guryanov as Disco Bolos, copying a shot from Leni Riefenstahl's film Olympia. And uh, for example, 2002 painting, uh, Montagnik, uh, uh, Fitter, uh, he uses the work of American industrial and military photographer, uh, Margaret Burke White. Uh, so in appropriating socialist, realist, and Western images, Guryanov creates models of homoerotic eternal masculinity. And in his remakes of socialist, realist themes, and show some examples here, homoerotic tensions coexist with kind of this dandyist detachment and supra-historical uh, coldness. Um, in a 2008 interview for the magazine Rich Style, he emphasizes the fundamental art temporality of the images he creates, which opens up possibilities for endless interpretation. And I quote, I want to show timelessness. I don't want to have any attachment to this or that era, so that the work of art remains relevant in a thousand or in a hundred years on. Uh, so, with uh, this kind of work, uh, he creates the image, what we call today, uh, sort of Soviet antiquity, when the Soviet legacy is as far away as, as the classical antiquity, which, of course, uh, is a questionable, questionable strategy. So... Um, the strategies of remembering and forgetting are very clear here. The artist of the new academy selected only those features of the Soviet past and aesthetic legacy that most vividly embodied classical 
ideals, monumental art and architecture, heroism, hierarchy, and the priority of space over time. Uh, the emphasis was on universal resistance and struggle against the enemy, how Noikov defined it, meaning abstract modernist art, contemporary curators, and Moscow conceptualism. Uh, according to Novikov, uh, this movement destroyed uh, the human body. It was non-humanistic, and it destroyed European cultural heritage. Um, with its constant stream of exhibitions, uh, New Academy popularized definitely popularized queer cu culture and queer visuality, which became kind of mainstream in Russia in the 90s and even 2000. Uh, but in spite uh, of the fact that this was very tolerant peri period in Russian history, Novikov and Buryanov never refer uh, to their art as queer. In, in the public exhibitions and manifestos, there was homo, or gay, or queer, uh, became, became concepts like beauty, the beautiful, uh, the cult of Apollo, renaissance, secret cult, resistance, or even narcissism. So instead of placing their struggle to obtain <clears throat> rights for sexual minorities uh, in, in a social and political context, Novikov, Guryanov, and others uh, from, this, from this group chose to emphasize only the aesthetical and historical side of, uh, of the movement and try to make queer art visible and, and uh, was seductive. And I think I stopped. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I apologize to our speakers for messing up the order that we had agreed <laughs> on. Thank you for bearing with me. Um, but last but not least, I am introducing now Alexandra Gayova, who is an assistant professor in modern and contemporary art in the School of Art History and Cultural Policy at, the Uni at University College Dublin in Ireland. She holds an AHRC-funded PhD from the University of Newcastle in the UK, which focuses on queerness in Polish art since the 1970s. Her ongoing research focuses on queerness and lesbianism in Polish visual cultures since the 19th century, Central and East European lesbian studies, and queer Jewishness in Poland. She is currently editing a special issue of the Journal of Lesbian Studies, on Central and East European Lesbian Studies and preparing a manuscript on lesbian art from Poland. Her writing has appeared in journals such as Third Text, Oxford Art Journal, Art History, and Art <laughs> Margins. Alexander, please. Thanks so much, Philip, and thank you. It's great to be here. Uh, so today I am going to give you a short, you know, uh, first attempt at theorization, the, the search of Polish lesbians. So it is um, an excerpt from, from the introduction from my developing book project. So let me just share screen first. Can you see the slides? Yes. 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 Great. Perfect. Okay. A silence descended on the room. It was tense, charged, tender, a little awkward. I was sitting at a small desk in the middle. In front of me, I remember a glass of water, a pen, blank sheets of paper, and three sealed envelopes. Around me, more tables, a person at each, all dressed in black and facing in different directions. And then there were more people some leaning against the walls, some sitting cross-legged on the floor. And one by one, those of us occupying the table, occupying the desks, opened the envelopes, took out the letter inside, read slowly in silence, and started writing. We were copying the letters word for word onto blank paper. I was taking my time. I didn't want to be the first to finish. As soon as I did, I would have to start reading the letter out loud, and I wasn't ready to hear my voice loud and clear and alone, cutting through the silence, all eyes suddenly on me. As I was reaching the last paragraphs, I heard somebody else's voice, and soon I joined in. Dear doctor, I am a lesbian. 
the slides, uh, the, the letters, sorry, in original were addressed to the Polish sex therapists or more aptly in Polish sexologists, Zbigniew Lewstarowicz and Wiesław Sokoluk. They took to responding to readers' questions and concerns in popular magazines. The letters, written and sent mainly between uh, the late 1960s and 1990s, were subsequently collected by Agnieszka Kościańska, the Polish anthropologist and historian of Polish sexology and sex education. The performance, You, Dear Doctor, Are My Only Rescue, was conceived by the artist Benny, ne Benny Nemer in collaboration with Kościańska. They had selected the letters from readers whose primary concern was feeling different amid an oppressively heteronormative Polish society under communism and immediately after, many looking for advice on how to get cured from their desires. Women wrote letters often, expressing an array of emotions varying from confusion and fear to resignation and despondency to joy and defiance. One of the letters was assigned to me and it was anonymous and opened with Dear Doctor, I'm a lesbian. The author continued. I think about her all the time. She's stuck in my consciousness and what's worse, I'm sexually driven to her. I can't imagine life without her. If I don't see her for a single day, I already miss her. I often want to kiss her and play with her. And with these words, I allowed for something to happen. I was penetrated and permeated. In me, I made space for someone else who had demanded I speak for her, but I also claimed the words as mine. Central to this melting of identities were my body and my desire, a recognition of the yearning pulsating in the letter. As the author confessed her longing to, to kiss, to touch, and to arouse the other woman, my mind, or the ghost in it, committed to producing images of the writer's hand sliding slowly down her would-be lover's exposed breast. Not only did I want for them to meet their desire, I wanted to be there and meet mine, and I wanted to take part. What the author of the letter had described, I now felt on my body. And in short, I was fantasizing about a threesome with a ghost in her imagination. What Polish lesbian studies sets out to accomplish in that way is to probe for a specificity of a category of Polish lesbian through desire. In a series of erotically theorizing exchanges with my American butch lesbian lover, I first came to understand and embrace my identity as a femme, and then immediately began to question how Polishness might travel this gender identification. With an American lover, what I am getting is clear to me and legible to her. We have abandoned American lesbian theory to work that out. What it, what it is that she is rolling around in bed with, to borrow from the seminal text by Cherry Moraga and Amber Hollybaugh on butch femme erotics, remained unclear as I rammed my way through US lesbian theory from the 1970s until the 90s. The Polish lesbian did not fit, the Polish femme lesbian certainly did not fit, seemingly anywhere not even as an anachronistic and unwieldy adversary to the feminist movement, as was the case for the US feminists of the 70s and 80s. Terry Castle famously wrote in The Operational Lesbian that the long-standing ghosting of lesbians, that is rendering their sexuality invisible through associations with the spectral and the ephemeral, underscores the pervasive cultural disavowal and social erasure of lesbianism. In the <clears throat> Sorry. In the Polish context, there's even fewer lesbian appearances, and so perhaps finding the way to Polish lesbians is precisely through giving them our bodies and desiring them with our bodies. In the absence of Polish lesbian studies and the absence of a community or a written shared history, I considered whether a good dose of lesbian narcissism, autoeroticism, and allowing a ghostly possession of the self as expressions of that narcissism and autoeroticism might serve as tools of self-recognition in Polish intellectual, artistic, and literary traditions that contain the fragmented, under-contextualized, and unhistoricized lesbian presences and traces. In the performance in Dear Doctor, the taking, ingesting, and finally regurgitating somebody else's words seemed indeed anthropophagic, hospitality in a Derridian sense, and there it derides, Desire is waiting for what does not wait. The guest must make haste. The stranger, here the awaited guest, is not only someone to whom you say come, but enter, enter without waiting. Come inside, come within me, not only toward me, but within me. 
occupy me, take place in me. And dear doctor, the words from the letters were ingested, entering the performance with no warning or preparation, yet we wrote and spoke and passed them around as though they came from us. Perhaps it was the, that, that we allowed ourselves to be entered and penetrated by those who had once written these words, claiming our bodies and voices. These were no longer the same words either, immediately reconsidered through the decades that separated us. A coming together of different consciousnesses was inevitable. The possessive entering was also a cannibalistic feast. You cannot enter or take place in me without also being devoured and ingested. Cannibalism and haunting together constitute an indelible exchange between the host and the ghost. What is shared is the host's body, fragile in its openness, but indispensable. Thus, through the host's desiring body and the host's autoeroticism, haunting and can cannibalism can meet us conceiving of an identity, in this context, a Polish lesbian identity. <clears throat> and dear doctor, I ingested an archival lesbian body um, as she possessed as she possessed me to use my body. What I was in fact cannibalizing, where I directed the act of erotic aggression, was my own body. The well-established yet contested frameworks of lesbian autoeroticism and lesbian narcissism help contextualize that experience into a broader potentiality of finding an identification as a Polish lesbian through the mutual legibility of haunting and cannibalism of art, history, literature, and the archive. The Polish lesbian subject may enact her anthropophagic, anthropophagic desire on Polish national identity by looking for lesbians in the Polish archive. By taking what and how she pleases of Polish national markers while rejecting others, the Polish lesbian's terrifying body is imbued with the power to ingest, digest, metabolize, and excrete Polishness that is new, threatening, perverse, deviant, and destabilizing. What is perhaps the most disturbing is that lesbians read in the way which positions them as neither women nor mothers from the perspective of the nation, not only interrupt, but could also inhabit a space on the continuum of male homosociality and homoeroticism, importantly, not as objects of desire, but as competitors, and as challenges to traditional and staunchly protected categories of masculinity and gender. Their presence is dismissed as deviant and perverse, but not only does this not deny their existence, it also points to the anxiety about what lesbians might do to Polish masculinity, revealing it as not not the religion, biology, or state-sanctioned status quo, but as a camp performance which ridicules the seriousness with which men fashion their solemn masculinities predicated on heterosexual national belonging. And finally, worst of all, is the fear of women who fuck other women, inhabiting the masculine phallic potential while un unconcerned by the absence of a man. A Polish lesbian reclaims her identity as both Polish and lesbian through narcissistic autoeroticism, looking for herself, which emphasizes the tension between the lesbian claim to national identification and the national identity which rejects her narcissism, eroticism, and resents her non-reproductivity. In the sparse writings on Central Eastern European lesbians, lesbian nationhood and national identity returns as perhaps the most frequently repeated concern, notably in the work of Aniko Imre and uh, Joanna Michelinska, for example. The latter particularly considers the notion of double, double, sorry, double lesbian uselessness as women and as mothers, but does not necessarily elaborate on opportunities which derive from being or being read as useless. So I want to propose this narcissistic, autoerotic, lesbian uselessness as a possibility of becoming legible to self as a Polish lesbian through embodied encounters with traces of Polish lesbians from across history. This is not an attempt to define a Polish lesbian or even to establish a shared Polish lesbian identity. Rather, I propose precisely that this autoerotic desire to possess and to be possessed lends itself not to lesbian visibility, which I critique, but rather to lesbian legibility, to herself in an archive, in history, through art and literature. Legibility also plays an important role in cultivating desire and in sex, 
it is being read by one another as lesbian, that is my main consideration, rather than being recognized, visible and othered in public as a basis for a collective identity only ever based on marked difference. While ostensibly erasing them from view in the national context, this lesbian uselessness in the context of the nation becomes their explicit claim on Polishness. It wreaks havoc with Polish national identity, challenging its compulsory white Catholic um, heteronormativity. As Michelinska writes, if not ignored by the national discourse, lesbians are constructed thereby as deviants. This, of course, positions them as not only useless, but also a threat to Polish national identity. And there is, I propose, a power of self-determination in claiming these accusations as useless, uh, of uselessness, perversion, and deviance. What the national discourse sees as a destabilizing threat might in fact be a radical opportunity for derailing the stale concept of national identity, not to belong to it, but to claim Polishness, language, history, culture, literature, and art, as a way of negotiating and making possible lesbian identity legible through lesbian narratives found in the National Archive. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you again to all of our speakers for preparing to share the, the broad variety of angles of, of really interesting work. And um, I do have a question that is about kind of the tension between the international and transnational on the one hand and the national, which I think emerged across papers really. Um, of course, uh, uh, just now in, in Alexandras, but I think uh, we should start with audience questions and do a first round where each one of you gets to answer uh, at least one question and then we can turn to my question if we have time. So let's go in the same order as we did before, uh, if that's okay. So that would make uh, Ramona our first uh, person to answer a question. And the question, I'll read out the questions if, if you don't mind. Um, so this is from, uh, unfortunately, we don't know whom, whom it is from, but it is a question for Ramona. How would you comment on the idea of respectability from the perspective of queer women in Romania? How was their situation during the formation of queer activism? Okay, so I'll try to be brief. Uh, so I can refer a bit to the queer and feminist activism, which started to develop during the 2000s. And it consisted of small informal groups of persons who are highlighting uh, representation and respectability issues in relation to some larger associations, such, such as uh, Accept NGO, which is the largest and oldest LGBT association in Romania, or they were highlighting these issues uh, in relation to what they called mainstream feminism, which was concentrated mainly around academia and maybe like these academic outlets such as Analyse Journal. And uh, these mainstream feminists, so-called mainstream feminists, were, were continued and they were continuing to ignore issues uh, uh, proposed by these groups, such as Roma issues or queer women issues. And I speak about this in my latest article that appeared in Sexualities very recently, and I can post the link. It's open access. I can post the link in the chat. Um, and this article is mainly about lesbian and queer accounts from communism and transition period in Romania. Uh, and this type uh, of queer and feminist activism uh, was just emerging, and it often clashed with uh, these mainstream feminist groups, and also clashed with some leftist groups, which actually in the beginning of this uh, activism in Romania, which is quite messy in a way, uh, this leftist group, some of the leftist groups considered that queer and feminist groups were too radical. Uh, and they also had other issues to solve before uh, diving into any feminist or queer uh, yeah, discourse or uh, thinking of <laughs> such uh, issues. And the NGOs usually just ignored uh, these groups. And of course, uh, it was also a matter of just regular women who were non-binary persons who started to just uh, join some LGBT NGOs and they continued to build the movement um, and they joined for different reasons or for different reasons they were actually uh, stayed in the background of these movements and I discuss a bit about this in my article uh, and there was also a time around 2009 and maybe up to 2015 actually when we witnessed 
that more women and trans and non-binary people started to form their own groups and became involved in, uh, in activism in a more visible manner. Uh, but still, I argue that on a larger scale, LGBT discourse in Romania is still driven by NGOs, and it's still very much focused on legislation, equal rights, and rights in the liberal uh, economical logic, and so on. So I hope I responded to. Thanks for the question, by the way. And I'll post the link. Yeah, that's great. Please post it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so then the next question will be for Luke. And uh, the question is, in the relevant and persistent critique of corporatization of queer desire, art, writing, do you recognize in this the impact of Soviet Marxism as an ideological, quote unquote, mother tongue? Uh, thank you for the question, Carolyn. It's, um, it's something that would seem, thinking about Maria's talk, which followed mine, you, you would think that there is this sort of conversation, especially in the case of Slava Magudin, given his background, and given the way he approaches, um, he approaches queer identities in the West with a certain, uh, certain disappointment. Um, but on the other hand, Pierre Ilyeshin, who would not have had any conversation with Soviet Marxism really, uh, experienced his his sense of queerness in the same way in an entirely different country in Brazil under under the dictatorship under the military junta, and I think that both of them are examples of trying to locate uh, a queerness in conversation with something that perhaps ultimately disappointed them. If you think of Pedernyashin turned to turn to Portuguese really and turn to the streets of Brazil to be queer but it was in response to a rejection from his Russophone readers otherwise there probably wouldn't have been the shift he wouldn't have started writing in Portuguese and Magutin is very similar when he arrives in the United States he as he has said repeatedly was penniless he had zero ability financially to do anything he had to rediscover how to articulate his art. And I think that given his background where he was already rebellious in Moscow and he was already uh, um, looking at queer avatars of rebellion from around the world, he had a choice in order to be able to integrate with what is a dominant queer culture or do something in contradistinction to it and set his own voice and try to destabilize it. And I think he chose the latter. So the Marxism question is a good one because it, it as a theory anyway, it might very well be applicable, but in their specific cases and in others that I wrote about in my book, for example, it's really more viewing queer as a colonial construct that they are seeking to undermine in some way or another. I hope that answers the question. Perfect, thank you so much. And then there, there are two questions for uh, Maria, but I think we can take them together because they're both kind of related to contemporary political concerns. One's from uh, Alexandra Yatsik, and that is the question uh, in the context of anti-LGBTIQ trend, of, of that anti-LGBTIQ trend in Russia. Um, how does the new queer classicism correspond with new Putinist conservative conservatism? Do they basically, uh, they basically look similar as both are referring to the Soviet body aesthetic, or um, do they promote different ideas? And the second question, Viktor Trofimov, do you think this focus on culture and arts and aversion to politics, I feel like this is a, a question we, we often try to think about, do you think this focus on culture and arts and aversion to politics is something that characterizes Russian queer culture in general? Um, thank you for the questions. Uh, I, I, I start with the second one. Uh, I think definitely yes, uh, when it comes to a new academy or kind of what I call the first generation of post-Soviet queer artists uh, who were part of the late Soviet underground. And uh, maybe you studied late Soviet underground and uh, what was particularly uh, interesting there that they, they didn't want uh, to be political uh, was not cool. <laughs> so I think this this group of artists who formed uh, in the late Soviet times, uh, 
they had this uh, very special attitude uh, to political actions and political activism. And it was not part of their, uh, uh, not part of their culture, uh, but contemporary Russian artists, Russian queer artists, I think quite, quite uh, you, you have queer activism in Russia today, but not uh, this late Soviet generation <clears throat> uh, to which Novikov and Guryanov uh, belong. So, uh, and uh, Alexander's question uh, about <laughs> uh, contemporary uh, kind of conservative visualities and that we have in Russia and um, new, new, new Academy and their aesthetics, yes, I think there is a lot in, uh, in common and there is a direct connection because <clears throat> several artists from the New Academy became uh, uh, a cons conservative artist that uh, Alexander Belayev Gintov uh, and many others, and they are part of, of this quite aggressive neoconservative uh, uh, camp that promotes uh, these anti-Western uh, ideas. So there is a direct connection, and I have uh, several pu publications about the this kind of um, uh, the way how the late Soviet uh, underground artists uh, became conservative and uh, became a part of this propaganda machine. But uh, uh, one one important moment: they are not kind of official artists of Putinism. They're still kind of marginal and in a way underground. But the ideas and aesthetics that they promoted, uh, they became now quite mainstream. It's not that they are kind of official artists of, of, of contemporary Russia, but uh, more than that, <laughs> the mainstream came closer to their intuitions and their uh, ideas about how the Russia should evolve. Thank you. And and in, in your case too, that article you referenced, I think if, if you have it a handy to post the link in our chat, there's probably no harm in, in putting it right there for everyone to look at if they, if they would like to. Um, so please go ahead if you can. Um, <clears throat> uh, the final, then we have uh, we have a question for for Alexandra, of course, and and this is actually a two part question and not related, but I think one can be answered fairly succinctly, Alexandra. So I'll I'll pose I really, I'll raise both questions. So um, the first question is, what examples of Polish literature do you feel are seminal for our understanding of queerness? And the second question is, um, what how the perception or whether the perception of Polish lesbians changed under Solidarność? Those are two questions. Great, thank you. Um, okay, so as for the first one, the examples of Polish literature, seminal, yeah. Uh, I would name two. One is um, Michał Witkowski's Lubiewo, which I think has been translated into English as Love Town. And it is a uh, history of two, of, of cruising in socialist Poland, essentially. Uh, it's structured as, um, these two gay men, or they call themselves fairies, um, they, they were being interviewed by a journalist and they recall their lives of cruising in socialist Poland on beaches, parks, and so on. Uh, the, the novel is just really visceral and really makes you kind of experience um, the histories of cruising, but also kind of what life in socialist Poland might have been like for uh, for gays, for queers. Uh, so it just really, I think, gave me this very vivid imagery of the time in my head as I was writing my PhD on kind of similar topics. And then um, right now, I would say uh, it's the um, you know, first proto-lesbian novel from mid 19th century uh, by Narcisa Michowska. The, the novel is called Poganka, which translates as the heaven. Uh, so in the novel, um, Zmichowska as uh, a male protagonist 
is kind of finally allowed to uh, be very explicit about her desire for women uh, because she is writing from the pers- from a male perspective. So she is disguised and kind of can securely um, write about women who are also the characters in the book are also disguised uh, actual real life women from her life that she had different relationships with. And it is uh, the, the novel right now, kind of Zmichowska as well, are both reclaimed by Polish lesbians as these kind of proto-lesbian figures um, from the 19th century that, you know, make us think about these very pertinent questions around um, women's movement, feminism, uh, but also gender sexuality. And I think that that novel is, you know, one of the first... Uh, if not the first, we can trace these uh, entanglements of womanhood, citizenship, national identity, nat- nationhood, but also sexuality and, des- and desire in the lesbian context in Poland. Um, so I'll leave it at these two examples and move on to the second question, um, the perceptions. Okay. Well, um um, it, it, I think it depends on what is meant by perception, but I think mainly we're dealing with invisibility and, you know, Solidarność as such wouldn't have been that interested under the best of circumstances in queer people generally. I mean, one of the activists came out as trans in the year 2000, I think, Eva Horschko and she has faced so much vitriol from Solidarność, uh, even, you know, 20 years on. So I'm not sure how queerness would have been, uh, would have kind of contributed to the visibility or acceptance or perception generally of, of queer people at the time. There was also, I mean, no community, no lesbian community in Poland at the time. What we do know from interviews and oral histories is that uh, it's that very fact that there were no uh, lesbian communities. Maybe gay activism was beginning to shape a little bit, but uh, lesbians were very sparsely attached to that, and the um, and gay activism did not represent their interests because it was dominated by men. Um, and and the lesbians who lived in Poland and the communism uh, really do speak of that invisibility of the lack of community, also to advantages of not being visible and not being recognized as lesbians. So I don't think that they would have self-consciously wanted to attach themselves to Solidarność necessarily. And in the context of from in the context of, of gay activism, even um some men have talked about how um they didn't want to participate that they didn't want to participate in Solidarność and its activities because of its close links to the church the catholic church uh so i might i would imagine from context clues that this might have been the same for lesbians so i'm not sure if there are like obvious easy links between what Solidarność was doing and how that would have affected lesbians in a kind of on public platform, if that answers the question. Great, thank you so much. Um, this this question also had a second part, uh, sorry, no, this, the, the first of your two questions, the questions about a, uh, a literary canon of sorts, um, also had a second part, uh, uh, the equivalent question about Romania. And uh, of course, uh, the audience might turn to Ramona's book for this that details the queer cultural heritage uh, of Romania in great detail. Is there ever so briefly, before we move on to the group questions, uh, is there ever so briefly, Ramona, any any specific text you would highlight for that question? And you're, you're I, guess, I guess there are many now, but actually I wanted to, to briefly respond to another question uh, that was in the I, I saw in the chat and it was quite interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, that I can read it here. Uh, 
So since you mentioned that there is a pushback against queer trans stories authored by those outside of the community, I wonder if there is a trend towards a more authentic representation within the community. And in short, what role do confessional narratives uh, slash life stories play in the Romanian queer art and how are they treated? And I have a very brief answer to this one. I guess it's a bit more uh, with literature. There is a lot in my book as well as in some articles, so uh, I can uh, show some links. But uh, about this question that I just read, I think it's quite interesting uh, that there is actually a trend of authentic representations and also auto-representation. And actually, it started a while back. I, I can I could think of some examples, such as uh, this short film made by uh, trans activist Patrick Braila. Uh, and the short film is called Abreast, Pieptish from 2016, and it's narrating narrating his journey as a trans person, uh, it's narrating his transition and the relationship with his family and his mother in particular. And he does not play in this uh, short film himself, but he writes, the, he wrote the script and he directed the, the whole thing. And then uh, very interesting was with the, the Institute of Change. Uh, which appeared around 2015, and this is a performance made by Paula Dunker, Paul Dunka, uh, which tackled this idea of fluidity and body fluidity and change in the body. And, and what happened there was uh, after the first uh, representation of this uh, this uh, performance, uh, queer community, some voices in the queer community, especially trans persons, reacted. And they highlighted the fact that there was not really any trans persons involved in this creative process. And then what Paul and the producer did was to make another performance in State of Change the second, where actually finally some uh, uh, yeah uh, non-binary bodies could actually you know interpret a bit you know, and they changed a bit of the stories. They started to do more interviews with uh, trans persons and such. So I think these are the, some interesting examples of where this auto-representation kind of works when there is an openness for dialogue and uh, people kind of start. And I can stop now and wait for the general question, but thank you for the question again. Yeah, thank you. That's really interesting. Um, so we have we have about five minute, minutes left. Uh, so maybe you can all very briefly answer to this question that is addressed to the whole group from Helena Gostiuo to all and any speakers. The Pirilation poem Luke Seide refer to age difference as a factor in a queer encounter. Given the role of narcissism in Magutin's work and life, and the narcissism that Alexandra repeatedly emphasized, and its centrality among the new Academy members, how does age affect narcissism? Its forms of expression, etc. cetera. Magutin now is around 50 and his narcissism in uh, my view, that is in uh, Helena's view, has evolved. So, and anyone who, who feels uh, inclined can jump right in. Yeah, we have about Four, four or five minutes, I believe. I can start with, because the Peri Yeshen and Magutin are specifically mentioned as well. It'll be a fairly quick answer. Peri Yeshen, um, I think there's a, a fabulous poem that I don't remember whether I put in my book or not, but if not, it's going to be in an article where he speaks about an encounter with a young man that he had once picked up in a cafe and he sees him now 10 years older and the whole of the poem describes his now repulsion uh, uh, towards the young man because he feels the young man has just aged, wears a silly mustache, and the young man still thinks that he is going to be attractive to Peter Yeshin. So Peter Yeshin's sense of, of narcissism, his, uh, his love of youth has obviously shifted in that the youth has to stay the way that he was represented originally. So it's fixated. Magudin, on the other hand, um, he it seems as if in his older work, what he what he's doing is portraying the youth, the masculine youth that he's still idolizing in in many ways uh, more in dialogue with powers that be, with queerness overall, with the interpretations of what sexuality is supposed to represent, as opposed to a specific identification. Seems like earlier Magutin was part of that crowd and he could identify with that crowd. Now he's further apart. He still sees, he still has the narcissistic interest, 
in what he's photographing and writing about, but he's questioning where that narcissism comes from. And that's a shift in point of view. Um, I haven't thought about that before, but um, now as I am trying to come up with some half-baked thoughts, I, uh, I, I've been thinking a lot about, um, you know, for lesbian self-memorialization um, and self-mythologization um, in the context uh, of developing alternative archives that, you know, if, if lesbian history does not belong in national history, in national archive, then you have to write your own history essentially and you have to come up with different ways of making history and i guess that comes necessarily with narcissism um and in that context i was thinking um about maria konopnicka one of the most celebrated polish um writers and poets from the 19th century um and her relationship with her partner Maria Dombrowska, who was a painter, and um, you know Maria Konopnicka wanted at one point for Dobro Dombrowska to paint her because she was upset that a newspaper would run her old picture, and she wanted an accurate representation of herself in the newspaper, which was clearly a much more aged representation. Um, so that I wouldn't call narcissistic necessarily, but rather kind of through, but then wanting to have your painting done by your girlfriend as well is kind of narcissistic. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily contribute that narcissism to aging, but rather to uh, specifically that compulsion to kind of to to be historicized to be uh memorialized in a way that the, the national discourse won't do for you thank you yeah I, I don't know if we're allowed one more minute if, if maria wants to answer are we allowed <laughs> probably <laughs> uh well the new academy is about melancholy about the loss of uh beauty actually so it's not, I, uh, I never thought about this, uh, and I will, Helena, uh, about age, <laughs> aging and, and beauty and narcissism in, in the new academy. But um, uh, I don't think it's, it's a question that exists there because it's all about eternity. And uh, it's a kind of our temporality. I think that's what, what's important uh, for, for, for the artists of this community. Uh, but that's, that's the best answer I have right now thank you okay well thank you from, from my side i would like to thank our audience uh, uh, for their participation as well as again thank you so much to our speakers and i'll pass the word on to chris <laughs> yes thank you everyone for joining us today and thanks especially to our speakers and to our moderator luke ramona alexandra and maria we hope that you'll join us for our fourth session, which is not taking place next Friday, but the Friday after. So mark your calendars for Friday, February 16th at 11 a.m. Eastern time. That conversation will build on today's discussion, but we'll look at queer studies through the lens of politics and law. So thank you again, and we hope to see you in two weeks time. Take care.